Good morning, everybody. My name is Jens Chapman, and welcome to the STED Talks Spine Technology Education discussion, discovery, debate, and today the D part is very heavily underscored by the R part of robotics. Uh, we have a phenomenal speaker today, Dr. Nick Theodore. He's going to join us a little bit later, but he's going to talk about how to uh, develop the next generation of surgeons in the most efficient uh, fashion using enabling technologies to the utmost. Again, today is uh, Wednesday, December 21st, 2022, and welcome to SSF. Uh, we're proud and honored to have you all here. And as always, we have a couple of thought-provoking cases uh, that uh, underscore the discussion part of the D uh, in terms of uh, what can we do and how can we do things. So I think first we have in his winter boots, it's quite cold here for Seattle standards, Dr. Chris Seidel, you can't see those, but he has some really nice, cozy, warm boots on uh, under his scrubs. So Chris, take the lead and show us what you got. Okay, uh, like Dr. Chapman said, I'm Chris Seidel, one of the fellows here, and I have a I have a short case presentation to show today. So this is a 78-year-old male Jehovah's Witness, BMI of 34, retired from the Army and then worked for the post office for many years. He complains of low back pain, buttock pain, and lateral leg pain, worse on the left than the right. He says it's a 10 out of 10 and it's constant. Um, it began about 10 months ago and it's been progressive since that time. Of note, he is status post uh, L5-S1 fusion in 2004, followed by a revision from four to one uh, in 2016. And then a spinal cord stimulator was placed in 2020 due to continued uh, back pain. Uh, his past medical history is extensive. Um, some of the uh, highlights are CAD, uh, carotid artery stent, uh, valve replacement, diastolic heart failure, CKD3, poorly controlled diabetes, COPD, uh, not a healthy guy. Uh, on exam, he has weakness with plantar flexion and dorsiflexion uh, with some gastroc atrophy. He has a weak EHL and weak hip flexion, uh, no sensory deficits. So here's the full length upright film and his lumbar films. You can see um, the prior instrumentation spanning from L4 to S1 where the inner body fusion is present. Uh, he's clearly got a flat back with spondylolisthesis at L2-3 seen on the upright films, but that's not present on the supine lumbar films. Uh, he also has collapse of that 3-4 disc space as well that you can see on the upright films. So Chris, just staying here, <clears throat> tell us all, first of all, um, what levels do those screws uh, bridge? Yep, so that spans from L4 to S1. Uh, L5 was skipped over. I'm not exactly sure why, because I don't have uh, access to those op notes. Um, I would assume it's because the pedicle looks very small on imaging that I'm going to show next. Um, but so you can the, see yeah, that something- This is one of those ethical, ethical things. And what, what's with these screw directions? Are those your new and normal screw directions, or what is that stuff? Well, I- as you'll see on the CT coming up, I think there's been some hardware failure at L4 because those screw paths are headed up towards a disc space at 3-4. Uh, I don't believe that that was the intent when they were placed. Uh, but the, the direction of these screws is one that kind of tries to do, quote, what? That's a mean, Tension. what am I thinking? Yeah. No, these are, this is a weird construct because um, uh, the surgeon tried to use less invasive techniques. Um, mm. So these are kind of wannabe so-called cortical screws at L4. Mm -hmm. So they're kind of aiming up, they're short, they try to engage cortex. Usually they're started more medial and ending up lateral. Yeah. Again, the goal is to yeah. have kind of a center approach and have maximum cortical purchase to make up for lack mm -hmm. of length. And the bottom screws, I'm not really sure what to think of those, but they fall in the same vein. The kind of ailer type screws that aim towards the sacral ala. Biomechanically, they are better or weaker than traditional S1 promontorium screws. I think they're weaker. By far. I, I don't know if a quantifier, but empirically speaking, and I'm a friend of ailer screws as a supplement, as you know, but these by themselves are worthless. Now, this is a instrumentation that really makes no sense because where's the cage located? 
So there's a cage at 4.5 and 5.1 as well. Um, you'll see that the fusions uh, at 5.1 took, but 4.5 uh, did not, and that's evident on the... What, was there a cage in there at 4.5? Uh, I, I believe that's a cage, yeah. some there's sort of peak cage, yeah. I have to put on my telescope yeah. loops. Yeah, it's, it's oh, difficult yes, to yes, see, yes. but there's a peak yes. cage there. Yep. Got it. <clears throat> Mm -hmm. Okay, and what's that stuff in front of the spine? Can you put the cursor on that? Is that a supplemental instrumentation? Is that a dynamic fixation? Uh, let's see. In front, are you talking about the calcified vessel? Right. <laughs> yes. Right. That's uh, so. Yeah. That's pretty harsh, right? Yeah, that's patient significant. Who, uh, has a severe vascular disease. Some would uh, call that patient yeah. um, a vascular path. So that's a a common constellation: large abdomen. Um, mm -hmm. multi-level degenerative disc disease, vascular disease, it's uh, also paraphrased as a metabolic syndrome. Yes. And I hate to be critical, but this looks very much like a um, very poorly done spine construct. This is a two-level construct, and again, I'm not sure what is where and how. Um, what's his pulse exam? What's his... What's his pulse exam? I don't have access to his pulse exam, sorry. Yeah, so this is one of those things when, as a young surgeon, mm -hmm. when you see calcific vessels, I recommend you have shoes and socks off of patients Absolutely. because it shows you the peripheral nerve system, the musculoskeletal system, but also their vascular system, both arterial and venous. And with this kind of a disease, I would always get a arterial duplex just to document it in addition to a pulse exam. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. All right. So when he's had the ubiquitous... Um, is that a dorsal column stimulator? Yeah, he has a spinal cord stimulator up in the, uh, I think it's T8, yep. around that level, uh, placed because his two lumbar surgeries did not take care of his pain. Got it. So okay. I'll move on to the CT. And he's a Jehovah's Witness. And he, yep, I concluded that yeah. in the beginning. Yep. So on CT, you can see he's got end-stage spondylosis from L2 to 5. He's got that pseudoarthrosis at 4, 5 inner body. There's loosening of the L4 pedicle screws, uh, poor spinal alignment overall, as well as poor uh, bone mineral health. You can see vacuum discs at L2 through L5. Uh, contrast gets trapped. This is a CT myogram, actually, and the contrast gets trapped at the L4-5 level and does not extend any cephalad to that. Uh, so there's some significant stenosis at that 3-4 level. So this is a mess now. So um, how would you classify the screw loosening? This is, again, something that's emerging. Uh, I would say that, that they're completely loose. I think that's a, what is that, C or... B on the Hicks scale. Yeah. yeah, so we have an emerging one. So yeah. these screws are loose, quite clearly. Yes, but they're not broken. Yeah. They're not broken. Yeah. So uh, are they salvageable? Is that, or yeah, can they be salvaged by a redirection? I think they can be salvaged with redirection. They're just poorly placed at, yeah. at one level. And 5.1 is actually healed, right? 5.1 has got a fusion, yep. Great, okay. So this is a problem. So mm -hmm. what would you like us to learn from this case? So I just wanted to include this guy's got very poor bone health. And to highlight again, he is not a healthy individual, as we have talked kind of extensively about already. Very bad vascular path, uh, heart failure, uncontrolled diabetes, kidney failure, COPD, not your ideal surgical candidate. Um, so your thought process here has to become how high or low do you want to extend this construct uh, given this patient's you know, overall medical condition? Uh, do you remove that spinal cord stimulator at the same time uh, or do you come back later and remove that or you just leave it be? Uh, and is there a role for maybe cementing at any of these levels given his poor bone health? So let's go back to the CT myelogram. So Dr. Harshat Parekh from, Parekh from Mumbai asked, let's look at the S1 screws again. Can you just show us the S1 screws and stop the axials? So the L5 is one foramina look good. Um, <clears throat> the, these L4 screws are obviously a problem, but now let's look at the S1 screws. So these are true Ehler screws. They're outside of the canal. So Dr. Parekh, they're outside of the canal, but these are what I said before, Ehler screws. These are meant to be supplemental screws and not primary fixation screws, but if you don't want to dissect out far lateral, 
you can kind of start immediately and aim laterally. But again, there's no cortical purchase. These are uh, very suspect screws, but there's no neurologic compromise. Um, mm -hmm. Rod, so this is your patient. Yeah. Um, there's the added twist then of uh, the patient being a bloodless um, patient. Uh, how high does the neurologic deficit go? Do you have a myelogram on this? This is the myelogram, is, but it gets trapped at three four. You don't see it extend above that. Because I don't four and four five. Yeah, three four yeah. four five. Yeah. Because I don't see on the sagittal image the okay. So it's just a profound problem. Got it. Now I see it. Yeah. Rod, so what are your thoughts? So there's a vascular disease. Um, Chris didn't know about the pulse exam on the patient. And yeah, he's uh, in vascular path. Poor, poor pulses. Mm -hmm. um, Do you get an arterial duplex in those patients? or You know, I didn't in this guy. I think he ended up seeing vascular surgery and cardiac surgery. Okay. He's had Tavar stance, all sorts of yeah. procedures. Good. So there's a substantial deficit, and then the disease goes to the L2 level, right? But do we have the patient who probably does not want any um, blood products? Yes. Dr. Tarek Sohail from Lahore, good morning, actually. Uh, good, good morning, uh, Jens. Uh, very interesting case. I think uh, uh, you want me to say something? Go for it. Yeah, I think uh, I agree with you that um, it's a poor purchase, but probably it's a poor bone, and it's probably uh, what you call is a shock coat uh, um, joint uh, in a diabetic uh, situation uh, in his spine. And I think uh, that's one of the reasons that he's got so gross degeneration and stability and the so poor bone quality. And I think in the first instance, they should have extended the uh, uh, construct to a higher level so that uh, they should have a stable construct at a uh, three, uh, two, three, four, uh, five, and a swan level, and they should have extended down to the ilium. Uh, the present construct uh, would have been much better purchased if they have uh, sort of convergent um, bicortical or tricortical uh, purchase. If not, then um, they should have opted for the iliac um, uh, base, uh, you know, uh, uh, construct so that provides stability at the uh, lower level. At the same time, I think uh, they didn't distract enough so that uh, there's still some osteophytes sticking into the spinal canal and the foramen. They need to uh, put some um, uh, sort of um, either uh, peak uh, HA coated uh, spaces or with the bone gap. And, uh, and I think in this situation, it's a difficult uh, healing uh, postoperatively. I wouldn't mind putting a bone morphogenic protein in uh, these uh, levels uh, which have been fixed and stabilized. And because if you look at the up, upper level, there's also cystic changes and they also disc is gone and uh, it is grossly uh, uh, unstable. And the present construct is developed, um, I would say the kind of uh, PJK and the screw is sitting in the disc and it's not uh, giving any hold at all. It's loose and uh, is uh, gone through. So I think um, uh, in nutshell, I think uh, uh, to me, it appears to be a sequelae of uh, diabetes uh, with um, diabetic uh, sort of Charcot uh, expression in spine and maybe screws alone should not have been enough. Maybe some augmentation with the uh, uh, cement of, you know, uh, those screws which are fenestrated and also uh, using a bone morphogenic protein to increase the potential of uh, Whatever process you're doing, you should uh, have some stimulus at the site of uh, uh, poor, in the situation of poor bone and uh, poor healing uh, potential. So I think uh, bone morphogenic protein would have been a good idea uh, in this particular uh, case. Uh, so yeah, Rod, so we all agree that yeah. surgery is necessary. Uh, I'm very glad to see that uh, there is a um, good friend uh, from uh, outside of uh, Seattle who agrees this looks like a arthropathy. I mean, hypertrophic bone condensation. It's a confluence of vascular disease, metabolic problems, and neuropathy that leads to this failure. It's not just mechanical overload, which obviously plays a role. So what's your plan? We are going to take the spinal cord stimulator out and then, you know, probably do me for the three. I can't remember what two, three looks like. Um, it's, it's pretty tight. I was going to try to do the minimal amount, you know, just like L2 to S1. Yeah. Given his Jehovah's Witness status yeah. and his overall medical yeah. comorbidities, I yeah. think maybe going less is probably yeah. Not going to do anything heroic here. Now, Rod, yeah. you're the one of the masters of XLIF. Why would you not take the hardware out, do a posterior exposure, um, free up the neural elements in one stage, 
bring the patient back and do a two-level X-lift uh, far lateral procedure at what we can call two, three, three, four to get lower doses and a bone healing surface and then take the patient back like uh, a week or two later with your previous exposure uh, and put posterior hardware in and to, uh, complete the fixation. I'm actually thinking about just going posterior and then seeing how we do with blood loss, putting in fixation and coming back and doing lateral. So. Okay. Interesting. To be continued, are you going to uh, prep him up with EPO or something like that? Does the patient accept cell you know, saver? No, he yeah. didn't. He kind of refused all. He refused a cell saver? I, I have to so. say that I, uh, when I have patients who are bloodless, uh, I respect that, obviously. Mm -hmm but I send them to our um, uh, bloodless clinic and I tell them if they don't accept a cell saver, check specifically with their church elders whether they accept cell saver, I would have them uh, pre-op with EPO. Uh, this is, uh, puts us into a real dire problem. Yeah. He needs surgery quite clearly. Um, I, I got to put my ethics of life preservation uh, into pairing and I think that we can't do a proper job if he can't even use a cell saver. That's a Real dilemma for me. I'd have to think that through. Mm -hmm. All right. And the diabetes, uh, so he's on 9.9. .9. I would not touch him until he's, uh, yeah. the patient is lower and his A1C, at least in the sevens, preferably lower. Yeah. Wow. You had to work that out. Yeah. Okay. All right. Good. Who's coming next? <clears throat> so this is one of those uh, complex cases of decision making. Quick and the flash drive here. Dr. Hicks, originally from Birmingham, Alabama, trained in one of the great orthopedic programs in our country, and we're Good glad to have him up here in the Northwest. How's the cold treating up here? Is our cold colder than the one in Alabama in the winter? Oh, man. Extremely cold. Walking in this morning. It's, it's a nice change. Join the Northwest. Here we go. All right, jump straight into it. 17 year old male suffers a BMX accident uh, in competition out in Oklahoma. Um, he has a C6 flexion teardrop fracture and T3 compression fracture. He's urgently uh, taken uh, for operative fixation, secondary to a neurologic deficit. And then uh, he then presents later to our clinic. So our first time seeing him is three weeks later and uh, he complains of deformity and drainage from his incision. Uh, he is ambulatory uh, at this time and actually in full strength uh, at the time we see him. So uh, we actually have his original uh, MRIs in our system. I think on CT, this is actually a little bit more impressive in terms of the compression of C6. Uh, but you can see some, um, hopefully on the other screens, we can see the cord signal change behind C6 there. So again, this was a 17-year-old male 17 year old. at the time mm -hmm. um, of the injury. He was 17 years old, otherwise very healthy. Very healthy, yeah. And he sustained this injury. How again, just for the audience sake? What's, what's that again? How did he injure himself? BMX accident. So he did a head plant? Mm -hmm. Okay, any other injuries? Uh, so he had a trace pneumothorax on the left, I believe. Uh, but otherwise, all his uh, injuries on the axial Axial okay. skeleton here. And what was his neurologic injury status? Um, so originally at time of injury, he says he could not move arms or legs, and he quickly recovered. Um, he presents to us normal uh, uh, AGE. So he's um, full strength at, at our, our time seeing him, full sensory. Got it. So um, do you have a CT of this injury? I have the MRIs. Uh, no CT the, of the injury. No CT. Um, there's a chest, abdomen, pelvis, but of just like thick cuts. Of, sorry, let me interrupt you. Yeah. Did they get a CT? Did we know? They of? had a chest, abdomen, pelvis that was transferred over to our system. Uh, mm -hmm. I did not have the original CT of the uh, cervical or thoracic spine. Now, in your very busy trauma center, a level one trauma center in Birmingham. Would you have gotten a CT of everybody, this? Everybody gets a CT Bingo, and, a, yes. and a CTA. Makes, so. This is kind of curious, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. But he presented in an outside medical center. I want to make this very clear. Correct. We don't want to mention where. Correct. Uh, out of state um, 
for this injury with this injury and he had a neurologic injury now he has a complicating other injury in the spine he does so our next slide here here's his t3 fracture um you know we talk about al classification of these you know whether it's going to be an a compression type b tension band or c translational um this is a rather severe compression type uh, with some posterior element involvement, possibly. Um, there's not a full thickness tear through the ligamentum there, but you can see the inner spinous and supraspinous is certainly stretched uh, posteriorly. Um, although there is no cord signal change at this level, I think we can attribute his original neurologic findings to the C6 uh, level. Now, um, Dr. Tarek Sohail in Lahore, he is one of the co-authors of one of our AO spine global trauma studies. I know we have limited imaging studies here, um, and Dr. Hicks can fill in the blanks, but let's start with the thoracic spine. How would you want us to classify this injury in the thoracic spine, Tariq? Uh, I have, oh, I'm gonna have a look at, uh, I think uh, it's, um, it's a burst fracture uh, in the thoracic spine with the retropulsion of uh, material, uh, to a certain extent in the back, and I think it's, uh, I would say it's a type B fracture. Right, yeah, I think this is a yeah. good argument for um, the tension band being involved, certainly posteriorly, yeah. um, increasing uh, it. Yeah, you know. maybe over this area, there's, a, there's a, some kind of uh, damage there, probably at this level. It's yeah. not very clear in the back how much uh, damage in the back is there, but at the, on, on this level, it appears there is this might be some damage in this uh, area. Right. Yeah. I mean, this is this is some this is a game that we can play, especially in these kind of right. injuries, until the cows come. We have three letters: A, B, or C. C. Yeah. Axial loading injury, bending injury, or circumferential. I mean, dislocated injury. Or translational. Yeah. So I'm gonna play this game with our audience. A, who, all of you have to raise your hands for one of the three options. Who thinks this is an A injury? Raise your hands. Nobody, who wants to call, oh, one, one A, good. Yeah. Who wants to call this a B injury? Two, three, four, and who calls this a C injury, a dislocation? Amanda, you've not, I've looked. I, do, 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 do. do you have what you have? You can't get out of this. <laughs> Based on what you see. A, B, or C, where was your hand? She called yeah. it an A. Yeah. Chris, you didn't raise your hand. A3. Yeah. And uh, what? A3. A3. Yeah. Rod, you're the treating surgeon now. This patient came to you now. What did you call this, an A? So a pure burst fracture, a B, a bending injury, a C, dislocation. B. A bending yeah. injury. So there's a posterior column disruption. Yeah, that's what I thought. So I would have put this at B. So yeah. again, one more time, Tariq, you've heard in our audience, the majority was for B. There, there was no, there were a couple of takers for an A3. Um, there was, I think, what did you call it? So what, did you raise your hand? You, you yeah, skipped my view. You know, I think when I think of B fractures, I think of a more of a typical chance type fracture. So either Flexion that's going to be purely bony or purely uh ligamentous and i think there's a compression component here so i'd say severe a so a3 that'd a4. be a b2 yeah if okay. you want to call it a bending injury b2 means there's a bony collapse in the front and a disruption right. in the back right so what is it now an a3 or b2 yeah, i think you're right no what you, i'm not right <laughs> i am not right i want to know uh, i mean i think it's a severe a type that's what i think so wait so is it but, an a3 then it's not a B, yes, B2. I think, I think it's an A3. It's um, an A3. But Tarek, what I do you make of our disagreements here? Tarek. Not there. Let's play this game for the cervical spine. Go back one more time. Oh, man. So, it's, so we had a disagreement here. So now here, do we yeah. have any posterior disruption? Can you illustrate this MRI sequence that you gave us? Is there a clear disruption of the posterior ligamentous complex? Uh, not a clear, but there is some edema posteriorly. So uh, I can't show you a definitive cut uh, showing that the ligamentum is completely disrupted. Uh, so there's at least a sprain in the back, but no at least full a disruption. Yeah. So what do you call this, an A3 or a B2? The, the anterior column, we all agree, is disrupted. 
Man. It's birthed in the canal, but that yeah. stays with You know, you put, me, you put me on the spot, but I think this exhibits the, I mean, it's a useful classification system. I think it's useful. Simulates the discussion of You're it. You're an excellent diplomat. I won't but let you wiggle out of this. I'm trying to answer the question <laughs> that, I, that I want to answer. So this um, is, yeah. Yeah. I, there's definitely a posterior element involvement. There's certainly a, a tension band component to this. Uh, so, yes, I think we're, we're stretching into B types. Yeah. Tariq, are you live or not? I need help. Tariq, help me from across the water. Okay, I call this an A3. Uh, okay. I don't see a clear disruption of the posterior ligamentous complex. Yeah. But again, I'd defer to Dr. Skuyan, who's now operating on the patient. I don't see that torn on these images. Mm. I would change my mind if I saw that torn. Sure. But this looks to me like a pure bursting injury that mm. would make this an A3. Okay. 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 That's my read, but that's just my read. That does not mean it. So, yeah, Rod, what, what did you yeah. call this? I mean, like you said, it's, I think, you know, there's edema um, in the posterior tension mm. band, whether it's an A3 or B. I mean, I think, you know. Yeah, we're kind of splitting hairs there, too. I don't think it's, I think. It, it wouldn't change. It wouldn't have changed my initial management, but I was an initial surgeon, so yeah. I, it, it would change yeah. my management yeah. because if it's a pure burst fracture in a osteodense patient, I would treat the burst fracture by itself with a anterior decompression and an anterior bicortical screw fixation. Yeah. So it would change my mind. No, I mean, the I'm talking about thoracic. Yeah. It, yeah. So, the, but the neck would uh, matter for the thoracic spine. If it's a pure B injury, a B2 injury, mm -hmm. I would just treat the posterior element. I would put a short segment. <laughs> Right. And, so that, yeah. and I yeah. would not worry about mm -hmm. the anterior column. I would not need to do the yeah. anterior column. Yeah. Makes sense. Tariq, are you live again? We missed you. Yeah, I asked yeah. questions. So the thoracic spine injury, we've had a disagreement here in our audience. I want you to be the judge. Is this an A3 or a B2 injury? Well, I think... Uh, uh, I think um, it's... a. Uh, B2 injury, um, there is a compression in the front, and there's also some ligamentous injury in the back, and it is not uh, displaced, and I think uh, uh, it's a B2. So this is, uh, I'm, I'm very glad to have you as my friend in my corner. Now go to the cervical spine again. Yes. Yep. So because I said B2, but others disagreed. So half of our audience disagreed. This is a cervical spine injury where this patient has a cord injury. Uh, same question again, is this a bad burst fracture, so an A3, or is this a B2? I think we can agree this is not a dislocation, it's not a C injury. I think uh, it is uh, probably a B, because the, if you look at the uh, posterior long chain ligament, both at the front, at the top, and the bottom of the uh, tip, both are damaged. One in the top between, um, between five and six is definitely damaged, and between uh, six and uh, seven, is partially were disrupted, and there's also element of uh, intrathecal uh, uh, bleeding there, which uh, which is probably uh, maybe contributing towards uh, neurological compromise. So this is again the difficulty, and we've written a whole paper about that. Also, as you know, uh, when is a posterior signal indicative of a true disruption? When is it just a sprain? And again. I don't see this torn, but I acknowledge that there's a higher signal on the stir on the right, but it does not look torn to me. So I would still stay with an A3, but I acknowledge that this is um, an ongoing set of disputes. Um, what we really miss, and I think you'll agree with this, Tariq, is when we have two non-contiguous injuries, mm -hmm. one with a serious cord injury, we have a whole different problem series. This is this escalates like, I don't want to complicate this, into a D category, definitive surgery, right? I mean, yeah. whatever it is, A2 or B3 or B2, once you have two non-contiguous injuries, one with a cord injury, that just adds a whole different set of uh, considerations. And that's one of the unresolved issues of these classification systems, because clearly we now talk surgery, and clearly our surgical planning is influenced with um, or by the the two nature uh, to the two levels of injuries. So, Jim, now take us down the road of what was done with this patient in an outside medical facility. Right. So, outside facility. Moving on to our next images. Stops um, again at that outside facility. When he uh, now he presents three weeks later to our clinic. These are our Scully films that we obtain. 
there's an obvious um, complaint of a, uh, a forward tilting posture uh, for him and really the inability to extend his uh, neck significantly. Um, it's affecting his forward gaze. It's affecting his entire posture. So tell us again what the surgeon in this outside hospital did. So did they do the anterior neck surgery first and then the posterior surgery yes. or posterior first and then supplemented that? Yeah, anterior? so they were nice enough to send us their fluoro shots as well. And so they, they went anterior first and then they proceeded to the posterior portion of the procedure. And they did all that um, obviously uh, in one incision posteriorly. Um, so Tarek, from your perspective on your computer screen with your colleagues in your room, what the heck happened here? This does not look very good, does it? No, I think uh, I would have done um, uh, and the cervical from the front only. Probably I wouldn't uh, gone from the back. I mean, I think they've done the good job putting a cage or uh, just any bone gap and distract it and put a plate and do a carpectomy or and uh, put a bone gap or whatever. But I think in the uh, thoracic spine, definitely uh, this patient needs uh, posterior stabilization. At the same time, from the posterior approach, you could go anteriorly and uh, distract it out and put up a bone gap, restore the uh, um, vertebral height as much as possible so that uh, the compression from the, um, on the, from the front is also uh, sort of minimized and uh, there's some sort of, but I certainly go from back and front at the thoracic spine and the front only in the cervical spine. So, but the patient is very unhappy now because his position of his head is way off. So, oh, what what's going on there? What, did the surgeon make a mistake? Is the construct collapsing? What do you think is going on? I healthy guy, seventeen yeah. year old. All the screws are well placed. Dr. Hicks, what do you think went on? Yeah, so I think um, positioning of the patient is very important. Um, whether you're using Gardner Wells tongs or whether you're using a Mayfield to. Uh, sort of a kyphotic deformation uh, at the thoracic, upper thoracic level and contributing towards a, a sort of. Um, cervical imbalance uh, in terms of uh, increase uh, C2. Uh, uh, C7 um, uh, SVA. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, that's what we think. I mean, I think the surgeon did not understand how to contour rods. Yeah. And, uh, is there a CT available, Jimmy? Um, Do you have a CT? Preoperatively. No, post-op. Uh, so we got a intraoperative spin uh, with the Zeme yesterday. But we have a post-operative CT from this surgery, they right? I know, but yeah, we I have a CT. Yes, of this there construct. is, and um, I don't have that included in this presentation. Okay. All but. right. Yeah. yeah. So they they used a computer guidance system, which is why we're showing this because this is a theme today: enabling technologies. So the surgeon used a computer uh, guidance system and used uh, a computer assisted rod bending to kind of realign the patient. And the final product doesn't look very good. You can see yeah. it on the coronal. It is still uh, kyphotic uh, at the junctional level, and I think uh, this uh, persistent uh, cervical uh, SU is there, and uh, there is a degree of imbalance, and the uh, patient may have a problem in uh, putting his uh, gaze forward, or he does, he can see forward uh, in front, but uh, but I think uh, he will get fatigued and uh, become painful uh, rather quickly. This is um, well said again. So we, uh, I'll ask Dr. Oskuyan because this is his patient now. Do you think that the anterior column not being reconstructed at, is that T2? T3. T3? Yep. Uh, did the anterior column fail at T3 or did the surgeon just bend the rods in this fashion uh, due to whatever reasons? I mean, I think I agree with Jimmy. I think uh, positioning is really important here. So I think, you know, the 17 year old kid, he's got normal lordosis and I think intraoperatively, it, he probably was fixated in this position. Yeah, so this is, yeah. Uh, this is why we're showing this case. So this is actually very sad because the surgeon probably did the right thing by doing a corpectomy uh, first. You can argue about whether he restored enough lordosis in that uh, segment, but it's okay. Um, and as a damage control and decompression, little argument. 
the real problem then comes with the posterior surgery where right. uh, high tech was used, but the patient was put into a clearly unacceptable malposition okay. for no particular reason. And so that's kind of regrettable because th that's a really good chance to kind of realign the spine, get the ears over the shoulders more or less instead of forward flexed. And in a non-related paper, but related paper, when we studied outcomes on cervical spine myelopathy treatment, posterior surgeries had way more pain than anterior surgeries, which everybody thinks makes sense. But a significant confound that we discovered was most patients with posterior surgeries were fused into kyphosis. I think that the main problem for this is that patients get locked into a head clamp, a forward flex, because that makes access easier. And then the head is not corrected when the posterior rods go. And I think this is personally what happened here. The patient was not corrected after the screws were placed with the help of a computer guidance system. And so the patient was fused into a uh, kyphotic position. So, and now we have an added problem with the wound infection. Right. So he did uh, endorse some drainage, and they were able to expulse drainage at home, mm -hmm. uh, even from his inferior drain site, uh, oh. including bone graft coming out of that mm -hmm. site. And how did the um, patient uh, do neurologically? Did the patient make a he, recovery? He made a, from what we can tell, a complete recovery to this point, um, which is pretty miraculous and uh, being a young guy. Um, so surgically, great... the first part, the cord injury part, was well tackled. Well, well addressed, yeah. Um, the two-level yeah. fractures seem to exceed the construct um, philosophy of the surgeon's uh, design mm -hmm. by being put into a fixed kyphosis at the cervical right. thoracic junction. Right. So we have a structural problem and a soft tissue slash infection problem. Correct, correct. So Rod, what are your thoughts about disentangling this now? Well, we, I talked to the parents for a while and given the fact that the, we were concerned that there was a wound infection and there was a, we got a CT scan, there was a very large um, uh, pseudomeningocele or seroma and so, um, you know, we kind of went back and forth and um, just because he's 17 and, and his actual, actual, they do it justice. He's so flexible. Yeah. Oh, we just had to go back in. Yep. And it was only two and a half weeks out. So, so Tariq, what would you do? So this patient has made a great recovery from the anterior part of the surgery where the cord injury was. Now we have a fixed kyphosis that is probably iatrogenic, and we have a wound healing problem, and he's two weeks out. It's a young, healthy 17-year-old. How would you fix this problem now? I think uh, I would just uh, uh, forget about this uh, uh, kyphotic uh, iatrogenic uh, deformation for the time being. I would concentrate on his um, uh, wound problem. Wound needs to be taken care, infection needs to be cared. Once that is taken care and it's all settled down, then one can go and revise it posteriorly and put a lot of doses in the, uh, in, uh, in the junctional area or in the lower cervical area. But that would obviously increase the morbidity of the surgery because at a later point in time... You not, not at the moment, but I think at the moment, uh, if, if we go and uh, probably it will increase the risk of further infection and further, uh, if there's any uh, pseudomeningocele or so, it will um, it will invite more infection, more complication at this stage. I would I would leave it for the time being. Let him um, you know uh, uh, go on with the, some uh, uh, functional problem, but uh, I would more consider on the wound healing and uh, tissue to settle down because uh, uh, wound healing to me is more important at this stage. Yeah. All right, so tell us what has been done so far, and I don't think we have a final result yet, but Jimmy, tell us yeah, what's so happening. He, um, we actually took him yesterday, and so he was admitted um, overnight for concerns for infection, the urethema around his uh, incision. Uh, went ahead and uh, thoroughly irrigated, debrided, uh, repositioned those T5 screws um, uh, to, to get some more bone purchase there. Um, and then went ahead and corrected for more lordotic posture. And in doing so, we were able to do some um, relatively minor facetectomies to release a little bit posteriorly to give them a little bit more. Um, but really, it was that uh, taking out the rod, you can see him repositioned very well. And we had the Gardner Wells tongs, um, which helped us a lot. You can um, see how much lordosis we got. Yeah. And, uh, and actually, probably this next. Yeah. So tell us about the infection situation. What did you find? Yeah, so uh, we got in there, and um, it was 
mostly seroma. Um, didn't look grossly infected. Uh, there was a lot of bone graft uh, very close to uh, his previous drain site, which we debrided. And we debrided a lot of um, uh, possibly necrotic muscle inferiorly. Um, but overall, looked very clean uh, at the end of our debridement. So you wa washed him out properly. So you basically relied on early washout and a clear reintervention. It looks like you got a beautiful restoration of alignment. We did, yeah. So this is a side by side um, uh, intraoperatively. So the left is what we started with as pre shot prior to scrubbing in. And then the, the right is um, our correction. Great. Um, Rod, any insights? Uh, what happened? How can this be avoided? What are your thoughts about uh, re instrumenting a patient with an infection? I mean, I think uh, intraoperative positioning is important. We use uh, Gardner Wells tongs mm -hmm. and didn't clamp the head. And um, I think we maximized the lordosis yeah. um, intraoperatively. And I've kind of gone away from using a Mayfield clamp just because you can't, regardless of how you change it, you know, you just can't get the same lordosis as you get with Gardner Wells tongs and, and letting the neck kind of drift back. Yeah. So I think positioning is a really important thing here. Yeah. And, and again, this is where I think enabling technologies, you know, sometimes it can hurt you. You yeah. know, um, I think they use an O-arm and uh, Bendini to put the rods in. In fact, if you go back, uh, Jimmy, a couple of slides, you can see they put in the, the um, on the coronal, you can see they put in the little bends the just for bends, it to go yeah. in yeah. and, um, you know, this is one of the downsides to using these, you know, because um, it'll just basically go based on your intraoperative, you know, where the screws are, mm. and then it'll bend it. it it's not going to give you what anatomic alignment you want to go to. It gives you the anatomic alignment that you're in. Right. Which, again, if you're, if you're okay with that position, it's fine. But if you need to change it, it's not ideal. Yeah. Yeah. Agreed. <clears throat> So this is um, this is a very instructional case for me because it uh, has a bunch of uh, learning principles, starting with our difficulties in truly classifying it well and uh, consistently, and then surgical details. And for me, the enabling technologies may have enabled a surgeon who's not that experienced to do the surgery. Uh, one other detail point: so the laminectomy looks like it was done up to and including the C4 level. And yeah. the hardware ends at C4, so the C3-4 motion segment is now posteriorly not protected. What do we think of that, Jimmy? In terms of 3-4? Yeah, 3-4 is not protected. Yeah. The laminectomy was done to C4 for whatever reasons, including C4. But yeah. this is a young person now, so this is not protected. Is that okay or? Yeah, you know, that, that's a good point. You know, I think the original injury didn't have any disruption posteriorly. So as long as you're preserving enough of the soft tissues in and around those, those joints and almost uh, curve linearly uh, with your bovie um, into the fascia up towards the top, you should be okay. Okay. Rod, what are your thoughts? So uh, why did this decompression by the outside surgeon get taken so high? And what do you think about junctional PLC integrity and long segment fixations? I mean, hopefully he'll be okay, but that's definitely a concern. Yeah. 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 So let's hope that he'll heal well, right? Right. Fingers crossed. Do you have any microbiology yet? Not yet. Okay. Yeah. We did, did take cultures though. So good. All right. All right. Thank you. So thank you. This is a very instructive case for many reasons. Uh, and we have Dr. Amanda Sassino with another case, a third case, and then we'll have Dr. Nick Theodore hopefully leave the OR in time to join us. All right, good morning. Uh, so our patient's a 43-year-old female with a very long history of spine surgeries, which I'll go over in the next few slides, who recently came into clinic with a progressive thoracic myelopathy due to a focal kyphotic deformity at T11-12, and she's diffusely weak on exam. 
So going by the old operative notes, this all started in April of 2019. Uh, she presented with left-sided paraplegia and was found to have a C23 intradural meningioma, causing effacement of the left anterior lateral cord. Uh, in May of that year, she underwent a C23 laminectomy for tumor removal. She had a little post-op seroma, but she had a great resection. Then in January of 2020, she presented with what was documented as a progressive craniocervical uh, symptoms, such as swallowing difficulty and quadriplegia. Uh, the MRI showed an arachnoid cyst around C2, causing effacement of the right anterior lateral cord, along with significant cord edema. She was taken to the OR for a widening of the decompression to include C1 and for cyst and fenestration. And I also want to point out on this MRI, you can begin to see that she has a little anterior listhesis of C2 on 3 and C3 on 4. Uh, she had improvement of her strength on her post-op exam. Then she returned in June of 2020 with worsening of her symptoms and was found to have a focal cervical kyphotic deformity with worsening cord edema. So she was then taken to the OR for uh, stage one uh, C3 to 6 ACDF, and then the next day for stage two C2 to 6 uh, posterior cervical decompression infusion. She again was doing well until November of 2021 when she presented with progression of a chin on chest deformity and incomplete quadriplegia due to DJK at the end of her construct. Uh, so she went for, to the OR for a C1 to T7 decompression fusion uh, and correction of kyphosis. Uh, they did multi-level smith peat uh, osteotomies from C7 to T4 to help with the correction. There wasn't a full standing scoli after the survey, a surgery, but you know I thought this x-ray at least showed the correction and alignment. Uh, this was the bottom half of the uh, x-ray for her construct. Uh, in February of 2022, she got an MRI which showed a new compression fracture at T67. Uh, so she went for kyphoplasties at that time. A couple weeks after that procedure, in late March of 2022, she presented to the ED with acute neurologic decline uh, and worsening of that T67 fracture uh, through the kyphoplasties uh, and a more focal kyphotic deformity. She was then taken urgently to the OR for extension of fusion to T11 uh, with T67 fracture reduction. Uh, again, there were no scolies in the close post-operative period, uh, but at least from this thoracic x-ray of the spine, the, the alignment looks much better. And then that's just a quick run through of the CT scan there. So now coming to present time, uh, she presented to clinic again in September of 2022 uh, with an end plate fracture of T11 and the form, forming of focal kyphotic deformity at that level. Uh, again, you know, this, this is the image that I showed in that first slide when I said that she came in with progressive thoracic myelopathy. And these are her standing scoli x-rays here, and you can see that she's pitched forward slightly. Uh, and to top it all off, you know, I just wanted to show she has very tiny pedicles, so putting in hardware in this case is a little anxiety provoking. Uh, but we just took her to the OR and we did an extension of fusion to L3 with a reduction of the kyphotic deformity. Um, you know, again, we don't have any any scolies yet because we we just recently operated on her. So I just tried to use the scalp film uh, from the CT scan to at least show some, you know, you know improvement of alignment, although she is lying prone in, in that post-operative x-ray. Uh, surgery went well. She's just having some issues with pain, controlling the post-operative period, you know, but I, I showed the comparison for her most recent surgery. But again, I just want to remind people that here on the left is where she is now. And this all started here with this small little meningioma in her cervical spine. So a couple of things to think about. So, uh, Dr. Scoot, what do you think happened in this patient? This is a horrible escalation of a beautifully uh, done initial surgical decompression and then just more and more collapse, forward tilting. If you go back, maybe this is a nice sequence, Amanda, by the way. If you go back to that initial series of the cervical fixation where the patient then tilts forwards, I mean, I think we can all agree that initial decompression was beautifully done, and then a multi-level fusion was done that stopped at C6, and the patient shortly thereafter comes back with cervical thoracic kyphosis. 
my question is a single single word question why i mean i think she kind of behaved like a neuromuscular patient um and i think you know um she uh was very spastic and had trouble you know i think she almost had i think one of the things she had after her surgery i think she had a little bit of a stroke after her second surgery um and so you know i think she had trouble mobilizing and lost a lot of her truncal um musculature and innervation and so she kind of behaved like a neuromuscular case I think we can agree that the initial fixation with restoration, can you go back one set? I think you had a cervical spine image before that shows a nice restoration. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this looks pretty good. Now there's one hypothetical question I have to you. Had in this initial uh, post-operative recovery, uh, sorry, post-operative construct, the posterior fixation been taken down to T1 or T2 to cross the cervical thoracic junction, could this junctional failure have possibly been averted in a neuromuscular patient? Potentially, I think that's that's definitely um, something that you know probably would have helped. Yeah, this is again not done here, but this is one of those things where I am sure the pa the surgeon wanted to minimize the surgical trauma, uh, wanted to fuse as few levels as possible, but in light of the general tendency of a patient who has a neuromuscular problem to drift forwards. Um, the muscle trauma inherent to multi-level posterior fixation. I would personally, and this may be totally wrong, uh, in an alternate universe have preferred to go to T1 or T2. This is again very different. Uh, there are multiple different setups. The patient clearly had major cord pathology and a beautifully done decompression, nicely shown the June 2020 MRI. So that's, without a question, a well-done surgery. But at this point in time, the main focus is to maintain alignment and not, um, uh, not watch about an extra motion segment, I think. And there was a stark mechanical failure set up at that C6-7 junction by stopping at C6. What do you think, Amanda? So I was thinking about this a lot last night as I was putting the presentation together. And one of my initial thoughts was even going back to the beginning for the tumor resection, if maybe they should have considered fixation at that point. Because as you can see here, the meningioma extends out laterally into the foramen and they went out there so that they could achieve a gross total resection. And so, you know, in doing that, you do have to start um, going into the joint a little bit and causing some, some instability there. And you could see on on her follow-up MRI, when she came back with the arachnoid cyst, she was already starting to have some anterior listhesis of C2 on three and three on four. And at that point, again, they went back in, they further widened the decompression now to get the cyst that's on the other side of where the tumor initially was. Um, so she was already beginning to show some signs of instability um, and maybe she could have gotten fixated at that point too. So that's a, uh, that's a very impressive kind of array. Rod, when do you, I mean, you do a lot of complex yeah. intermedullary lesions and uh, subdural lesions. So when would you, in a case like this, instrument the patient? Amanda raises a very good point that maybe at the index surgery, the well-intended, well-done resection alone was the decision-making failure and a posterior instrumentation at the same time may have averted this whole cascade. I usually try not to, but I think because it was, uh, they did kind of a far lateral approach and took out a facet joint, I think it set her up yeah. for a failure. So I think in this case, I probably would have done like a C2 to C4 fusion. Yeah, I even try yeah. to show on this image yeah. here, the axial, you can see the, the beginning of the joint on the one side, but then on the other side, when they went out into the foramen, there was compromise of the joint on that side. So it's a great point. So then the second point, now if you go forward, so your correction um, of the latest failure looks really good. Um, I'll go back to that. So my questions here are, Rod, so when do you do an intradiscal osteotomy to support the anterior column to jack that up and lengthen it? Uh, because here you, it looks like you just relied on posterior fixation. And um, so this is a T11, 12 junctional failure. So yeah. why not put a spacer in there to jack the spine up more? And what about the caudal fixation at L3? So he has two effective motion segments, L5 is one being very degenerated. So why not stop at L1? So she had, that's a great question. She had a, um, 
uh, almost like a chance type fracture. You can't really see it there, but she fractured the pedicle. And then I thought, you know, um, we thought about doing an IDO there, but it reduced so nicely. Um, and she's so compromised neurologically that I didn't want to mess with the, you know, um, having any more potentially neurologic dysfunction or, and so I thought, you know, down the road, you can always bring her back for a lateral to get inner body fusion, but we got such good correction. I didn't feel like there was a need to put an inner body cage, um, at the time. Because my other worry yeah. is that the add-on device, those junctional tubes, can you put the cursor on that, Amanda, on the second from right, maybe? So you did a very nice add-on surgery, uh, but those connectors are now right over the fulcrum point of the posterior attachment. So there's a very strong strain on this equipment in terms of forward flexion. Yeah. So do you think this is strong enough? Because there's no anterior column support. You've kind of indirectly relied on the posterior tension band. I, I agree with you. Um, and uh, it's definitely a concern. It's one level above, we put it. We took out the last screws and went one level above. But I think it's still there's still going to be a strain there. So. Dr. 51. Dr. Tariq, so hey, do you have any comments on this case? I I think um, it's a very nicely done index surgery. I think uh, I must uh, appreciate uh, the dexterity of the surgeon. But I think uh, because of uh, uh, poor neuromuscular control and neuromuscular dysfunction, uh, the bone have become weak, parotic, and the tension band principle become totally uh, uh, incompetent. And I think she's sequentially develop have a DJK and that DJK has gone uh, right up to the uh, mid thoracic to the uh, lower one. I think now uh, she looks uh, fairly balanced, but I think uh, probably if I wouldn't have put any uh, thing to jack it up from the front, um, though uh, just uh, alignment uh, would have been okay. Um, and she has done so far. I think she has gone beyond the uh, DZK level. Now I think she should be okay uh, because uh, the uh, junctional, uh, the lower level of uh, instrumentation is fairly uh, reasonably well balanced with the disc at the um, sort of uh, uh, more horizontally and they're fairly good looking. Maybe she needs some uh, medical um, sort of uh, treatment in terms of uh, fortigo that uh, she can uh, develop some bone strength. Uh, to, to to help uh, down the line. I might have it on my laptop. I can check. I can check. Yeah. So this is this is for me one of those very uh, interesting and insightful cases, yet also troubling cases because we do not have um, uh, we're in damage control mode now. We we don't have the chance to go back in time, but it just shows again how decision making is so absolutely important from the very first time in every single thing in spine that we kind of miss or misconstrue can backfire big time in terms of not being uh, not being forethought enough that it can't withstand the rigors of life. And this patient clearly over. It just three year period has had like how many spine surgeries now, Rod? Five or six? A lot more than that. Yeah. So that's a that's a big deal. Uh, so um, a very unfortunate situation. Um, again, my my personal comment would have been that um, we uh, I would have probably preferred to put some cages into those junction zones because there's a very sclerotic, abernized vertebra, so biologically kind of compromised, and. Um, the posterior attachment things now are right in the biomechanical fulcrum more or less. There's going to be a lot of pull on them. And this patient has a long lever arm. So that's my concern that this could pull apart yeah. and uh, fall apart. So that's uh, that's my concern there. Uh, how did she do neurologically? Is she doing fine? She's doing fine. She's back in her baseline. No, we're going to continue to watch her, and hopefully we won't have to do anything more. But I agree with you about you know, having that area be the weak point. Yeah. So we're looking at uh, Dr. Sassino is uh, pulling up a nice presentation that you gave on a sacral fracture of how to do advanced imaging in patients uh, with complex injuries, for instance, and use technology to benefit. Oh, Dr. Theodore's here. Great. Nick, let's uh, get a picture of you. 
Hi, sorry, this is his assistant. Dr. Theta is just walking in from surgery. He'll be in a minute. I'm sorry. No worries. Thank you. So, and uh, Amanda, do you have your talk immediately available? How long does that take? Is that like five minutes? Great. So we'll ask Dr. Sassino to just have as a backup um, her sacral fracture things available. The, the theme today is again, uh, how to use enabling technologies uh, for our advantage. And we saw some illustrative cases of where ultimately the decision making on the part of the surgeon um, is key. It's less the technical application of screws and more uh, relevant to uh, the success seems to be the decision part on the, the part of the surgeon. And just because that had a lot of whiz bang, we want to show a positive case. We've shown this once before, but in order to fill time for Dr. Theodore, we thought we'd just flash this in. And this was done at Johns Hopkins, this case, and show some cool high tech put to good use in this case. With apologies to those who've seen this case before, but I, uh, doing these kind of complex sacral fractures a lot, Rod and I really liked this case because it has some technical tools in it that we don't routinely have available to ourselves. Okay. Um, yeah, so as Dr. Chapman said, I had presented this previously. Um, so this was a case that I had done during my chief year with Dr. Timothy Witham. Um, so the patient was a 70 year old female with a history of osteopenia who initially fell from a standing position. She had gone to her local ED. They told her she had a sacral fracture. She went for 10 days to a skilled nursing facility for PT and pain control. Um, she then had come to Maryland with, to live with family who had brought her to our ED because she was unable to get around with her walker. Um, she presented to us with right lower extremity pain, uh, weakness, numbness, as well as groin numbness, no incontinence, um, although her PVR was elevated. Uh, on exam, she was weak distally in the right leg with saddle anesthesia, but normal rectal tone. So she had a severe sacral fracture with spondyloptosis of S1 on S2. Uh, she had destruction of the bilateral sacral ala, um, and there's a complete separation of S1 on S2 causing lumbopelvic uh, dissociation. Um, I couldn't get a nice cut of the uh, the corona on the coronal cut, so I tried to make this 3D model here uh, to show spatially the severity of the sacral fracture. So on the sagittal MRI, she had stenosis at L3-4, um, and she had herniation of the ligament and dura mater uh, from a bad durotomy through the posterior uh, fracture site at S. L5-S1, and to correlate this with the distal weakness on her exam, the L5 exiting nerve roots were stretched along the anterior margin of the ala fractures, uh, as depicted by the blue arrow there. Uh, these fractures extended into the bilateral S1 foramen, where it's very difficult to trace out the nerve roots after they exit the foramen. Uh, there's obviously severe stenosis of the canal at S1-2, which is compressing the distal sacral nerve roots as depicted by the arrow. So due to her worsening neurologic exam and the setting of the severe and stable sacral fracture, we offered her surgery. We offered her an L3 to pelvis for reduction of the fracture. We used a Jackson table with a sling for the knees, like it would be the typical setup for a sacrectomy to promote relative flexion and distraction of the sacral fracture to assist with the reduction. Uh, I didn't appreciate it at the time that we did the surgery, but we did get some reduction of the fracture from positioning alone. And the OR registration uh, was for our, our intraoperative navigation, and that's what we used for the case. Uh, so for this actual case, we used a augmented reality, a navigation. This is our intraop setup. So that was me on the right, Dr. Withams across for me, uh, and you can see that we're wearing headsets. And when we use navigated instruments, this is the example of the display on our headsets. Um, you can also monitor the navigation on a screen, and that, that's an example of pedicle screw placement. And the video is an example of uh, cannulating an S2AI screw. And then we cannulated screws from L3 to bilateral S2AI. 
Uh, we then decompressed at L3-4, where I had shown the stenosis on the MRI. We did osteotomies and medial facetectomies at L4-5 and L5-S1. Uh, and another thing that I just wanted to note with that as well is that since we were using image guidance, we were able to very clearly look at the nerve roots that were being stretched along the ala fractures and to make sure we didn't further compromise, compromise them with reduction of the sacral fracture. Uh, we then placed screws. Uh, we used fenestrated screws at uh, L3 uh, for cement augmentation. At S1, we used reduction screws. Uh, we used this to perform a distraction maneuver where once the rods were in place, we were able to lock the rod onto the S2AI screws and pull L5 and S1 up to the rod to help reduce the fracture. We then locked in the rest of the construct. And as you can see here, it's difficult with interop x-ray to assess reduction. Uh, so we got another O-arm spin. And even with that, it was still difficult. Uh, we used BMP, Optium, and Autograph to help with the arthrodesis. Uh, so this was the pre-op CT. And then on the post-op CT, we got a good reduction of the fracture. Uh, the patient had immediate pain relief in her right leg. Her dorsiflexion improved uh, to four out of five from three out of five. Um, we talked to endocrinology. We got her on calcium, vitamin D, and anabolic agent to help with her osteoporosis. And then she was discharged to rehab on post-op day seven. Uh, two months after surgery, she was doing well, given the circumstances. She was home from rehab, uh, and she was doing in-home PT. Uh, she wears her TLSO brace when standing and walking. Uh, she's made incremental improvements in her walking, though not very far, but better than pre-op. Uh, her exam was a little different than immediately post-op. She now has bilateral weakness and dorsiflexion plantar flexion, uh, which you know was contributing to her difficulty ambulating. And she had also developed a DVT, but her pain was much better overall, and she had been trying to get off pain meds at least the last time that uh, I had checked in on her. So no, thank you for filling in, Amanda. That's a beautiful case, and I just thought this is a great segue to our speaker, Dr. Nick Theodore. Um, if we look back uh, on time, good morning, Nick. Uh, good morning. Uh, we showed three cases that kind of showed how technology had been used with good hardware placement. Thank you again, Amanda. So these are my disclosures, which, which uh, as Jen's alluded to, are, are, are relevant uh, for this uh, talk with, with respect to robotics. Let's see here, we're, we're not advancing. So when we talk about surgical training, it's it really, it's nice to take a deep breath for a second. And, you know, I'm sitting here at Johns Hopkins and, and the reality is that surgery, you know, modern surgical era was really born here. We've got Halstead, Cushing, Dandy, and this, you know, the definition of dogma really is a belief or set of beliefs accepted by the members of a group without being questioned or doubted. And during our surgical training, we learn things one way and we tend to stick with that. And that's, that is, uh, that is really part of why enabling technologies are slow to be adopted because again, that you have to be trained on them. When you look at the evolution of technology in surgery, uh, especially in spine surgery, really it's highly related to imaging. And, you know, our ability to see inside the patient beginning with x-ray and then moving on to CT and MRI scan. And now, you know, Amanda just gave a beautiful uh, representation of looking into the patient with uh, augmented reality. Who would have thought that was possible even just a couple of years ago? I think in neurosurgery, the, the game changer for us and then the, the predicate really was the ability to uh, understand where we were in three dimensions. And this is Watanabe uh, back in the 1980s with frameless stereotaxy for, for brain surgery. And now in you know most developing countries and, and in the United States, for sure, there really isn't a brain operation that's that's not done without navigation. And you know this is a slide from about 12 or 13 years ago. Uh, when we were utilized, first utilizing image guidance uh, for, this is upper thoracic screws, and you can see here, we're, we're putting in K-wires. And the, the fact of the matter is that you have to be confident in that technology. One of the things I realized at that point was or we, there was still an attention deficit. We were still looking away from the patient. And I think that's part of the problem. And that's where some of these enabling technologies may help us. 
When we talk about image guidance, the question becomes why? Why would we use image guidance? Well, what do we want as surgeons? We, we want high accuracy and we want high precision. We want to be able to hit that bullseye every time. And if you look at the literature, unfortunately, we're not quite as good as we think we are. This was a study that was uh, published uh, here at Hopkins before I got here in 2011. You know, 6,000 freehand pedicle screws. It was about a 9% re rate of breach. About 1.5% of those uh, screws were were uh, were out. About one person, almost one percent, needed to be reoperated on, which is which is good. But you know, the question is, can we do better? We did this. We sort of revised this now, looking forward in in the era of robotics. And this was a 51,000 screws. You know, and, and let's look at the thoracic spine where, where a lot of the, the errors are kind of, you know, occur because of the anatomy, you know, especially in, in patients who have dysplastic uh, anatomy, thoracic spine, scoliosis cases, et cetera. You know, we found, again, freehand, the, the breach rate was about 12%. We get back to navigation, it goes down to four. And then when you use enabling technologies, we really can drop that down even farther to the 1% range. Dan Lubelski, who's one of our junior partners here, published a very nice paper just looking at intraoperative image guidance for spine surgery. And this is from the Cleveland Clinic. They found, you know, decrease in malposition screws, statistically significant. Hospital stay was less. Uh, decrease in spine-related uh, readmissions, which is misplaced hardware, et cetera. And then reoperation for hardware failure was decreased as well. When we first started using robotics, and I'm not going to be Pollyanna, the, this is, I'm sure everybody saw this in the Chinese Neurosurgery Journal. I know uh, Rod gets this every day. Um, the, but the reality is, when we look at this, you know, we, we have a beautiful ability now with robotics to do what we can't do. When a master surgeon like Jens Chapman puts in pedicle screws and they're 100% in bone, that's a very lofty you know, place to be. The reality is that we now have the ability to say, okay, this is what we planned and this is what we placed. So you see the CT scan, the yellow is where we planned. There's a deviation. Look at D, for instance. Look at G. The reason those are deviated originally was we found that as we were entering the bone on a, on a steep precipice, there was a bit of uh, deflection or, or skiving that caused us to be off in, a, in, a, in that plane. So what we have now, unlike the Gertzbein Robbins, which is really, are we in the bone? We're not in the bone. We now were able to do volumetric analysis. I can tell you percentage range, how we hit the mark. So this is not, we're in the neighborhood. This is now what are uh, volumetrically, what is our percentage of accuracy and why, what went wrong? Why are we a little lateral? Why are we off? Nothing will ever be perfect in surgery. We know that. But the question is, can we do better than we're doing now? And I think the answer is yes. When you look at, you know, review of the literature now, the, you know, this, this came out a couple of years ago. Uh, again, robotics, knees, and this is from the orthopedic literature, uh, spine surgery improves placement, reduces radiation exposure. We know that. Roger Hartle published a very nice article in 2013 where he said, you know, here we are, 1996-2013, only about 10% of people were utilizing uh, image guidance at that time. And the reason for that was that there was a, a disruption of workflow. We want to be accurate. We want to also be able to do the case. And the fact of the matter is that up until 2013, people were slowed down. And I go back to the dogma, which is if people under, you know, were having an issue with um, the way they were trained, nobody wanted to branch out. And certainly not if it was going to make you slower. I think now we're finally crossing that chasm as, as you know, our residents are being exposed to these technologies. We're really at a golden era now where we've had significant advances in imaging, surgery, and robotics. So we've got image-guided surgery now that's been around in neurosurgery now for over 30 years. We have surgical robotics, robotics with the da Vinci and others. And now we have this melding of the three for image-guided surgical robotics. And this really takes us into a different, uh, a different realm uh, of hopefully automating our accuracy. So if we use NASCAR as an example, this is 1964. The car is pulling in. This is Rod driving into work in the morning. And, you know, they, they get out, look at the, doing some fender work. Hey, look at the fender on the left is broken. Can you fix that? Sure, we'll go ahead and fix that. Let's go ahead and fix the fender here. And this is really, if you think about it, this is sort of the way we, you know, did surgery in the 1960s. Big, slow, lumbering. This is, you know, 1984, a few years before I started training. 
uh, by about 10 years. But, you know, this is this is it. This is the way we learn in certainly in neurosurgery, big exposure, find the pedicle, find the TP, find your entry point, triangulate. And this is this is, you know, the way, you know, really generations of surgeons were sort of taught, you know, protecting the neural elements, obviously, at all times. We fast forward to 2016 and we look at NASCAR and things are a little bit different, aren't they? The team comes out and everybody working in coordinated fashion. We've got all four tires changed. We have oil and lube done. All the systems are checked. He's already waving them off. And within 12 seconds, we're back on the uh, on the race. And when we look at surgery now, I can tell you that for an MIS TILA, patient's position, trackers are in. From skin incision, we've got four screws placed in five minutes. I couldn't do that before, that's for sure. And the the reality is, you know, being able to automate really a more mundane part of the procedure, uh, but but high risk nonetheless, because obviously misplaced screws are bad, it, it puts us in a different era. And I would say that, you know, like NASCAR in surgery, we're evolving. Oh, there's no there's a sound not working on this. Oh, here we go. So Larry David being escorted out at that point, uh, you know, still hanging on to the to the to pass. I think that uh, um, you know why why robotics. Uh, you know, there's a, several reasons, and patients are driving this somewhat. We don't want that to be the case. Radiation exposure for those of us who are still, you know, for those who are still using radiation is a real entity. Uh, I cannot tell you how many you know problems we've seen in the literature. Uh, with you know orthopedic surgeons, spine surgeons being exposed to radiation causing cancer, cataracts, et cetera. We want procedural consistency. We want to be able to, to take those cases, collapse the operative event, and make it safer for our patients. We want something that fits into the operating room in a workflow such that it doesn't disrupt anybody. The residents aren't disrupted. The techs aren't disrupted. In this case, the a robot potentially can be rolled in you know, used and then push a button, unlock it, it moves into the next room. So we're doing this on a daily basis now. The workflow issue is key. And I will tell you that having flexibility is also key. So for instance, uh, imaging considerations, being able to plan with just fluoroscopy. So we can now just get an AP and lateral x-ray only. We can get intraoperative cone beam CT, or we can use preoperative uh, CT scan. So there's multiple ways to, to, depending on where you're practicing, to uh, enhance your workflow. Again, you don't want this technology to slow you down. You also want feedback to be able to understand if something is deflecting, if your surveillance is not accurate, because again, the whole issue is trust but verify. You have to understand that this is a different way of doing surgery. And when people say to me, well, we need to teach residents how to do things open, well, the fact of the matter is, I don't know, Jens, about you, but are you signing up to have an open L2 to the pelvis when I can do that with smaller incisions and less blood loss? Is that a question? The answer is yes. You want to be open? You want to be opened up? Yep. All right. I'm, I'm not so saying. Listen, so, so Rod, Rod, yep, Rod's called the blood I'll, bank. You've I'll got, take percutaneous. Thank you. Well, so listen, it's always a, a topic of discussion. I don't, I understand the reality is we'll get, we have four units of, of uh, blood typed in cross for you. And we're ready to go at any time. So we're going to show a few cases here. Um, you know, again, th this is not what you want to start off with. This is a, one of our, our typical Baltimore patients who comes in complaining of back pain and some difficulty walking. And, uh, you know, we've got this significant kyphotic deformity, you know, osteomyelitis. And, you know, again, two issues. One, Screw placement is one thing, but the navigation, understanding where you are in the corpectomy, understanding what your, your boundaries are, that feedback that you get really seeing into the patient is crucial. Uh, and I will tell you that it is it really has become, uh, it really needs to become part of our armamentarium. This is a young woman who has multiply operated on for tethered cord, and we were kind of, she was going to have a spinal column shortening where we take out the T12 or T body, shorten the spinal column to take the stretch from the spinal cord. This is a, a sort of a neat way of doing things. But, you know, again, we're in neurosurgery, probably one of our least favorite operations is the multiply operated on recurrent tethered cord. Those patients, unfortunately, are miserable. We don't have a lot to offer them. But 
uh, Kokubun described this case first in the 1980s, and being able to take out a vertebral uh, segment T12 at the level below the, the lowest dentate ligament has been great because it allows us to shorten the vertebral column and uh, take stretch off the spinal cord indirectly. I'm going to show you this here. Here's the part of the problem with this young lady. And when you look at the anatomy, doing this case on the day, my resident calls us, you know, her pedicles are small. And I go, yeah, they are small. And the fact of the matter is being able to, to uh, reliably navigate and uh, with a with steady arm do pedicle expansion and get pedicle screws in this case. And here's the shortening aftermath uh, really is a, has been a game changer. Because again, those would, those would be very difficult if not impossible to cannulate by hand. And this is just to show you pre-shortening, you see the axial ultrasound of the spinal cord, really not much excursion. And look at the spinal cord after. It's got a, it's, it's more round and it's, and it's dancing the way it should be in the spinal canal. And this is a pre and post operative MRI scan. There's some metal artifact, but what you see is the spinal cord is not bowstrung at the bottom here. It's, we've got a, a laxity in the spinal cord. And, and this was published last year. It's open access. It really have had great results with that. But let's go back to, you know, where things are beneficial. So this is a, a taxi driver from Baltimore who got run over by his own taxi. Long story, but it does happen. Uh, t unstable fracture here, ankylosing spondylitis picture, BMI of 50. And oh, by the way, he's a Jehovah's Witness. So the, you know, he's got pulmonary contusions and the anesthesiologist looks at me as we're rolling and goes, you're not going to lose much blood, are you? Well, certainly if we had done this open, we, I don't know that we would have survived. But the reality is this is an operation which was done in an hour uh, to percutaneously fixate this gentleman. And, you know, we had a preoperative hemoglobin of 7.6 and, you know, postoperative, you see the cancer there, 7.4. You can't really contemplate doing that without some sort of enabling technology. It doesn't have to be robotics, but image guide in some way to be able to not necessarily have to open this gentleman up. We're doing hybrid procedures. This is a multiple myeloma case where instead of opening up and taking all the soft tissues down, we can percutaneously place the screws above and below and then decompress the spinal cord. You know, if you can use it during the day, you should be able to use it at night. This is a police officer who came in, known history of scoliosis, uh, in, a, in a horrible uh, accident and basically has a complete spinal cord injury. You see this T12L1 offset here, fracture dislocation uh, at the apex of his, uh, his thoracic curve. And unfortunately, uh, you know, comes in Asia A. Again, being able to, to get him fixated rapidly, get him uh, distracted and get him corrected um, is something now we're doing in the middle of the night. So, Again, when it comes to workflow, this is a situation where we can actually uh, wheel the robot in utilizing you know, um, either the O-arm or preoperative CT and be able to reconstruct somebody in the middle of the night, re-expanding the spinal canal. So uh, it's a little bit interesting. This is a gentleman here with a atypical hemangioma with some cord compression, radicular symptoms. These are treacherous lesions. You know, we can talk about on block resection, et cetera, but the reality is they're benign. In, back in the day, they were sclerosed with alcohol. The problem with that is and they developed instability. So the opportunity was to try to do something a little bit different. And so we planned a single level fixation above and below and then planned to cannulate the pedicle. I had my endovascular colleague come in. We, we did, had angio and were able to, uh, with onyx, embolize this uh, tr in a transpedicular fashion. And ultimately, symptoms better. And, you know, game over. That was about an hour and 10 minutes. So a different way of doing things. You know, this is this is a multimodality case where, you know, where you're either sending the patient to angiography or you're sent for spine surgery, et cetera. But being able to do them in one setting in the operating room uh, is, is an exciting way to think about things. So we'll move up to the cervical spine. This is a gentleman who was surfing uh, in Ocean City, Maryland. And you can see he's got a bilateral hangman's fracture. Uh, but well, he also has some subaxial stenosis. So unfortunately, he's got a central cord syndrome as well. It's not usually happened in this injury, but you can see the stenosis here that he has, uh, it's signal change. And usually this is going to require, you know, to be able to decompress him, we'll fixate him, and we're going to lose that motion at the atlantoaxial junction, unless we try something a little different, and that would be a direct PARS repair. Again, this is not something that most would try without image guidance. I would not. 
you know, knowing what your quarters are and what your tolerances are, we were able to put uh, screws bilaterally across uh, the PARS defect to correct that while decompressing the spinal cord at the same time. And this is a neat way we've spared him motion uh, at the atlantoaxial joint. And, you know, when it comes to this, it really, we talk about training the residents. And this is a different way of, this is how dogma gets changed. I don't want to be dogmatic, but the fact of the matter is, is we start doing things as attendings and, and, and teachers in neurosurgery. The, the residents follow because they see one way of doing things. There's always more than one way to do things. We talk about robot training again. You can t definitely teach an old dog new tricks. This is Ali Biden and Tim with and my partners. Do you, know, do you know what the problem with this is? Nothing. nothing. It's too easy. Everybody, yeah. Everybody's got to become a sponsor. The, the fact of the matter is, again, you know, as we're taught one way, we have to be able to think about things in another way. We looked at this when we first started doing cases. This is our, uh, we published this paper a couple of years ago with 28 match controls in our first uh, robotics cases. And, you know, ultimately we found that the blood loss was less, the length of stay was less. But here, this is the take-home message that two things, accuracy was, was definitely improved uh, in the robotic group. But this is the, the take-home message here. We started off, it was four hours, you know, four and a half hours to do a single level, two level case. Again, there's a learning curve. We decrease by on average about four and a half minutes a case. I can tell you now that we're reliably less than an hour and a half now for a single level case. And that comes with practice, that comes with building teams, and that comes with familiarity with the uh, with the technology. But to think that you're going to do an MIST lift in an hour and a half using any technology is just not going to happen in your first case. So again, you have to be patient. And it looks like there's about 20 cases to get to that learning curve. So when, you know, when we talk about that, again, that also has to boil over into the education aspect of how we teach residents. So I agree, you know, I think Jens would probably say, and I can speak for him, but I'd like to hear his thoughts on the fact that, you know, the training residents, understanding the anatomy is never going to go away. Just because you have a different way of doing things doesn't mean that we're, we're not teaching the anatomy, but we do have to think about this. We're not, we go back 30 years with cholecystectomy. I was a medical student at Georgetown. And I remember the attending saying, endoscopy, nobody's going to do that. It's just ridiculous. The private practice guys adopted, and that's the way they're all done. And I will tell you that we have a different, we're in a different era now with our millennial residents. They learn differently. And, you know, you want to see this slide, Jens, because you've got the, you've got the baby boomers and the millennials. And the reality is that as we start <laughs> understanding how they learn and how they teach. You got this great team players for the baby boomers. Expect everyone to be workaholics like we are, hardworking, productive, self-sufficient. The millennials, a little bit different. Very tech savvy, actively engaged in social media, learning by exploring, want continuous feedback. You're doing great, uh, Rod, great case today. But a reality is it's a different way of learning. And this is, we have to be cognizant of this. You know, there's a great article in the New York Times uh, a couple of years ago, looking at this as well. And one of the things I talked about was for surgery was skills. And they said that surgeons are not doing the same things with their hands that kids used to do to give them hand-eye coordination. And I would argue that that may not be entirely true. We give video games a bad rap, kids sitting around on the couch playing video games. But when we now we see the fact that we we can, this is a, this is a video training of removal of a foreign body from the larynx. And it's, I mean, as real as you can get without actually sticking an endoscope down somebody's throat. So I think that we're definitely changing the way we think about things. And, and that brings up other technologies of how we can train residents without having to open the patient up from top to bottom. Surgical simulation is one, virtual or augmented reality is one. And again, you know, better cadavers and, and, and cadaveric training. These are these lifelike cadavers. If you've seen these cadavers, you can actually make, you know, have them 3D printed to have scoliosis or other problems. I just saw a technology where you can actually have CSF leak, which would be great. You know, as you're doing a uh, as you're doing a uh, decompression. So, what does the future hold? I think the future, you know, is is bright for all of us. Surgical education really is going to be depending on the learning style of the student and how how they learn. As the field changes, obviously, the education has to change. 
ultimately we're driven by the data and, and that's what's going to change it. We still, we talk about, you know, outcomes, we talk about all that. And I think that the data is emerging rapidly that is enabling technology not only helps us to be more accurate, but can certainly collapse the time of the procedure. And those two are very powerful drivers of outcomes for our patients. So as we put everything together, um, I think that, uh, you know, we have to keep learning and keep pushing forward and, and trying new things. We may not adopt them, but we at least have to try them. So apologize for being a couple minutes late. And Rod, Jens, as always, even virtual, it's a wonder, a pleasure to see you both and certainly uh, can take any questions. Great stuff, Nick. Thank you so much. Yeah. Please accept our virtual and real applause. For the record... Perfect. My screen time on my phone is longer, is larger than that of Rod's, and I use two thumbs for typing, unlike <laughs> Rod. He uses an, so just, just a small little tech thing. And yes, I'm on the purple and red side of the Hartle, the Roger Hartle adopter curve. So just two quick questions for mine because we're running a little bit late. Um, number one, that the cases were fantastic and as always beautiful. Oh, yeah. I'm not surprised you're a master surgeon. Uh, so whether you have a robot or not probably doesn't add much uh, to that. But let's just put this situation into that uh, Baltimore cop with that horrible T12L1 fracture dislocation. You're in the OR. It's the middle of the night. You have one robot. You turn it on. You're very experienced. The damn thing doesn't work. I know it doesn't happen in your OR. What do you do? It does. Do you, do you, <laughs> it does. Open it, do you open it up or do you cancel it until the morning? No, no, of course. Listen. This is a, you bring up a very good question. Let me just tell you one quick analogy. So Michael Lawton, who's a dear friend of mine, who's chief at Barrow, you know, I asked him the same question. I said, Michael, you've got a 13-year-old girl with a tumor in her brainstem. Okay, she's got a cavernous malformation in the middle of her midbrain and image guidance goes out. Are you going to cut open her brainstem? and take out the, you know, look for the tumor. And he goes, well, of course not. Well, there you go. So I will tell you that in that case, you know, if it's a trauma and emergency and you're, you know, you're getting ready, the, we're going to do the operation. This guy needs it, wanted it at least for, 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 you know, to be able to decompress the spinal cord. That's the goal. Yes. I would open him up and I would do it open. The, the reality is that as we, as we get better, as we have more redundancies built in, the failure rates can not, you know, will be decreasing. You may have two robots, a backup robot, et cetera. But I think the same thing applies here. At some point, you have to decide what's best for the patient. And, you know, again, if you've got ongoing cord compression, I would argue that the best thing is he's going to get decompressed with robot, without a robot, with a kerosene or without a kerosene and do, do, do what needs to be done. But I think, you know, as this becomes more widely adopted, we'll have more, redundancy built in and we'll have more fail safes built in because again in, a, in the image guidance and the brainstem is the perfect example at some point you're going to decide that if you don't have that technology it's not safe to do the operation so this leads me to my second question uh, of the threatened promise two questions and that is we now have actually made this technology shift so i'm clearly on the purple red side our our young trainees usually that come here are very dependent upon navigation for hardware placement. So the freehand uh, screw placement seems to be actually getting a dinosaur lost art. Should, in your opinion, who's educated so many generations of surgeons, should our training emphasize freehand and good common surgical skills before reliance on technologies? Or is this just a total shift where we just say, okay, we are in the tech era now. Well, I think you bring up a, a very salient question. And I, I don't know, I don't know that I have a perfect answer for that. I think we have to, there's no way you cannot know the anatomy. You have to understand the anatomy. And what could happen is that that could be taught categorically, that could be taught virtual reality now. There's other ways to teach that rather than, you know, subjecting patients to, you know, open surgery uh, with the end game of, of, you know, utilizing that technology. But I think anatomy is the key. And I think the reality is that that's never, that's never going to go away. And understanding the indications, understanding the pitfalls of the technology, because to your point, they may be, the newer next generation may be more reliant on this technology but they under you know, they still have to be the surgeon. They still have to understand it and what the pitfalls are, so that if something does change, uh, they're able to uh, to make a shift and 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 continue to get good outcomes. 
By the way, I want to acknowledge Dr. Ahmad Fawad Pirazat, our uh, president of the Afghani Neurosite, uh, Neurosurgery Society, for joining us. It's a privilege to have you, sir. Uh, so thank you for your presentation. Final question for Dr. Oskuyan. Hey, Nick, that was great. Um, are you currently, so one of the, I think, obviously, I think robots are in the future. What do you think about the workflow? Do you think there's always going to be a robot there? Because I think one of the downsides is that, you know, if you, you, it's such a, um, you know, expensive capital piece of equipment. And, and um, what are your thoughts on the future? Do you see us moving away from that? It's going to depend on where we go. Listen, I think the one safety thing for us is that I don't I don't think hardware replacement is going away anytime soon. And mm -hmm. we're going to always have trauma. We're always going to have tumors. You know, degenerative stuff. We, that paradigm might change a little bit. Scoliosis. We're always going to have that. Have the, those cases. That's I don't think that's changing anytime in our lifetime. Um, getting away from it. You know, you saw the case that Amanda presented with Tim with and my partner. Having, a, you know, whatever that enabling technology is, yeah. I think it goes back to image guidance. There's going to be cheaper paradigms for sure. Uh, again, it depends on workflow. What I will tell you is that what I'm most excited about is, you know, potentially doing away with the CT scan, having a synthetic CT, either converting an MRI to a CT and navigating that way, which that's a game, that would be a huge game changer. So I think other, th I think the biggest advent, the biggest changes will be in, our imaging and how we are able to see what we're doing. Uh, right now, image guidance for robotics, I think are in the same category of and tools that help us get to where we wanna go. It's it's like your red phone. It's always it's always good to have the red phone. I'll be right there. <laughs> All right. You're much in demand. We'll let you go back to the OR. It was uh, so cool to see you. Always a pleasure, always learn from Thank it. And uh, entertain yeah. at the same time. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you both so much. Have a great day and Merry Christmas, everyone. Talk to you soon. Happy holidays. Great to job, Nick. Thank you. Bye-bye. Great to see you.